Hey there, this is James Carberry, founder of Sweetfish Media and one of the co-hosts of this show. For the last year and a half, I've been working on my very first book. In the book, I share the three-part framework we've used as the foundation for our growth here at Sweetfish. Now, there are lots of companies that have raised a bunch of money and have grown insanely fast, and we featured a lot of them here on the show. We've decided to bootstrap our business, which usually equates to pretty slow growth. But using the strategy outlined in the book, we're on pace to be one of Inc.'s fastest growing companies in 2020. The book is called Content-Based Networking, How to Instantly Connect with Anyone You Want to Know. If you're a fan of audiobooks like me, you can find the book on Audible, or if you like physical books, you can also find it on Amazon. Just search content-based networking or James Carberry, C-A-R-B-A-R-Y in Audible or Amazon, and it should pop right up. All right, let's get into the show. Hey everybody, Logan with Sweetfish here. It's a new year and a new decade, and we're celebrating by rounding up the top 20 episodes as we look back on 2019. We'll be sharing them here throughout the month of January in our hashtag best of 2019 series. We've reached the end of our top 20 countdown of the best episodes of 2019, and today you hear from Christopher Lockhead again. He did a two-part series within the Category Creation Series with John Ruggi here on B2B Growth. Another great conversation with him is why it comes in at number one in our Best of 2019 series. If you like this topic of category creation and category design, you may want to check out Christopher's own podcast, Follow Your Different. It's one that I really really enjoy and have been subscribed to lately as well. If you enjoyed this episode, but you didn't catch all of the top 20 of 2019, you can go to sweetfishmedia.com slash blog, scroll down and look on the right hand side for hashtag best of 2019 in the categories there, and you'll find our top 20 episodes from all of 2019. Hi there, and welcome to another episode of the category creation series on the B2B growth show. I'm John Ruggi. This is part two of our conversation with Chris Lockhead. If you haven't heard part one yet, pause your podcast player right now and check that out first. There's some great foundational material in there about what category design is and why marketers should care about it. A quick refresher about Chris is in order first, though. Chris is the author of Play Bigger, the go-to book on category design. He's a widely accomplished Silicon Valley CMO, and he's been described as the Bruce Willis of category design. In part one, Chris shared why he thinks category design is a marketing superpower, why the category kings tend to capture 76% of the market's economics on average, and how legendary businesses need to design a great company, a great product, and a great category. Now, in part two, we'll hear why Chris believes Pepsi's attempt to unseat Coke as the category king is one of the dumbest marketing efforts ever. We'll hear what Picasso can teach marketers about the importance of being different. And we'll hear Chris explain why trying to convince people that you're better than something else can actually work against you. Now, when we left off, Chris had just finished telling us how legendary companies spend more time on marketing the problem they're solving and less time marketing the products themselves. When we pick back up, I'll start by asking Chris for his take on whether aspiring category designers need a huge marketing budget or if category design can actually happen more organically. So without further ado, here is part two of our conversation with Chris Lockett. So you're talking about defining this problem and marketing that versus the product itself. Does that process mean that you have to have a huge advertising budget, a huge team to support that, a big kind of PR push? Or is it uh, you know equally, or can it be effective if you kind of are taking it from a more of a grassroots approach or more of an, or, or an organic route? You can absolutely take the more organic route. And Victor, Victor Hugo famously said, all the armies of the world cannot stop an idea whose time has come. And so in a lot of ways, category design is a, a process, an approach to making it your time. And so as you go to execute from a marketing perspective, what you want to ask yourself is, what's the best way to have my point of view about a problem and therefore a solution catch fire? And look, would having a $250 million marketing budget help? Sure. But you know, if you look at it, most startups don't have anywhere near that. And so the thing you got to ask yourself is, what are the ways in which I can move the thinking in the space to my agenda? 
and begin to ask yourself that. And, you know, we can get into tactics if you like, John. There's, there's a lot of ways to go after this thing. But fundamentally, you're doing something different. What most people are doing is they're competing. They're competing on price. They're competing on speeds and feeds. My carbodingulator's, and I'm going to use this word on purpose, better than your carbodingulator. And anybody who's having a better conversation has fallen into a product, feature, and price war. And that's always a race to the bottom. The other thing about this word better is when I say my product's better than your product, what's left in everybody's mind is your product. Better is a comparison game. And so, you know, right now, I don't know if you've seen this ad, the idiots at Pepsi are spending God unknown millions of dollars on a new campaign with um, uh, the guy from the office. And which guy? I don't want to a lot of TV. Which, uh, which character? Uh, the main guy, Steve Carell. Steve Carell, yeah. And the first set of ads have this, uh, are I think in a diner, if I'm remembering right. And the waiter or waitress comes up to these folks and says, you know, what can I get you to drink? And they say, you know, we'd like a Coke. And the waiter says, will Pepsi do? Or is Pepsi all right? Or something like this. And then this actor gets up and says, is Pepsi all right? Well, Pepsi's awesome. And it's this and it's that. And, this. and I'm sitting there going, you dumb effers. You guys are so stupid because the minute he says, well, Pepsi's, what do you mean Pepsi's all right? They're comparing themselves to Coke. And so whenever we compare ourselves to somebody else, what's left in the mind of the customer, the consumer, the buyer is the thing that we are comparing ourselves to as opposed to our own unique space. And so all they're doing with this multi-zillion dollar campaign is telling the entire world that Coke is the category king and we're not. It's the dumbest marketing campaign maybe in history. And that's the trap that everybody falls into, this, this comparison game. And all the comparison game does is validate that the company and or product you're comparing yourself to is the category king and you're not. So it really works against you because you're, you're having the conversation on someone else's terms instead of your own. Yes. And yeah. you're also, the game is wired against you because the rules have been created by somebody else. The minute Gojo Industry says, well, it's not about how do I wash my hands. It's about how do I get my hands clean in the absence of water? They have redesigned the way we think about it. Yeah, it's it's funny you mentioned that Coke and Pepsi example because uh, a few decades ago, they did that famous kind of taste test campaign where they talked about how Pepsi tastes better than Coke, which is exactly kind of going against what you talked about earlier. It's, it tastes is subjective, but they're trying to position... They, they were trying to position Pepsi as kind of an objective better a product than Coke. And then, you know, 30 years later, they're still fighting the same bat battle. Yeah. The other thing that the, the category does, of course, is they look at who number one is and they assume that number one is the best product. That's the assumption that you and I make. The other thing that's interesting, if you get into the human psychology of it, John, is human beings are pack animals. We don't want to be an outlier. Because if there's 10 of us together in the woods and two of us are way over here and eight of us are over there, the two that are way over here are the ones more likely to get eaten by the bear. And so every user of Zoom makes potential users of Zoom more comfortable that Zoom is what I should do. And so human beings are herd or pack animals. And so we are comforted by buying the product or service that is the category king. Yeah, it's like, I think in the book you mentioned, it's kind of a, a self-reinforcing cycle where the category um, king is seen as, like you said, the best product. And then people buy that product or that service because it's perceived as the best and it just continues to cycle itself or drive itself from there. And I know one of the other points you made is when companies are faced with a potentially new category that's coming to market, there's a real need for them to take the initiative and define that because if they don't, someone else is going to do that and, and it'll be caught in kind of a, a secondary position. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'll give you one that has been going on in the tech industry for a long time. A lot of people say email sucks. I hate email. When's somebody going to reimagine email? And this has been tried many, many times. 
And the reason that no one's been able to displace email, even though many of us uh, agree that the email paradigm is not maybe the greatest paradigm, is because everyone that has tried to take out email has been using email as the point of reference, right? So if I say to you, hey, John, don't think about pink dinosaurs. Whatever you do, no, no pink dinosaurs. Don't think about pink dinosaurs. You can think about anything you want to think about, but not a pink dinosaur. You can create any animal you want, any color you want, but just no pink dinosaurs. What's in All your right. mind? Yeah, of course, pink dinosaurs. Right. And so the reality is, if the problem is, how do we have an asynchronous communication that shows up as a time-based feed in an inbox, well, email wins. And everybody who has tried to take out email, for the most part, has lived inside of the framing of the problem that is email. And until you reframe the problem, no one's going to take out email. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense, John? Yeah, it's like you're you're talking about your offering in terms of kind of the wrong problem. You're talking about why it's better than something else. It kind of goes back to that Coke versus Pepsi example. It's like you're setting the stage of, you know, this is why what we're doing is better than email. Now, all of a sudden, someone has to maybe give up email to use this new thing, which poses a huge kind of mental barrier that they have to get through. And instead of taking them to maybe a new way of communicating and reframing a different style, um, maybe synchronous, you know, or non-time based, uh, perhaps, but um, like that that shift is, it hasn't happened. They're like, they're talking about something that is, is working against them. They don't really have a way to talk about what they're doing in, in a way that maybe complements email or goes on top of email or kind of benefits you in some other way. Yeah, I'll give you a simple example that I think certainly I can relate to. Maybe most people can as well. There's a small chain of restaurants in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, sushi restaurants. Now you think about sushi restaurant as a category. It's a well-known category. Uh, if I say to you, hey, John, we're going out tonight for sushi, you have a picture in your mind of what that is probably going to look like, right? Yeah. So this company said, um, we're not going to solve a problem called how do you make great sushi, which is the problem that most people look at when they open a sushi restaurant. Maybe they, and maybe they think, how are we going to make great sushi and, and make money doing it? Maybe they look at it that way. Anyway, however they look at it is how they look at it. And they do what most sushi restaurant entrepreneurs do, which is they compete on how awesome our sushi is, the location of our restaurant, how awesome our staff is, and the value that we deliver, i.e., you know, price per quality is good. And they, they accept those kinds of dimensions, if you will, of competition as the only way to compete. And what they, what they hope for, because they're artists, because they're, they're chefs, is that when they open their restaurant, people are going to say, wow, that's the best sushi I ever tasted. That's how most entrepreneurs think. And that's how tech entrepreneurs think as well. Oh, that's the greatest algorithm ever, right? Oh, wow. I've never seen a carbodingulator so fast and so elegant, right? That's what they're all trying to build. So this small chain of sushi restaurants reimagined the problem. And here's how they reimagined it. They said, we love sushi and we love eating on the go, but sushi on the go sucks. I don't know if you ever tried to eat sushi walking down the street or eat sushi in your car while you're driving. Like it's a disaster, right? Because the sauce yeah. gets everywhere and the you know rice gets everywhere and it doesn't. Sushi is not a good portable uh, food, right? Yeah, closest you- thing I've had is those uh, those pre made sushi containers at the grocery store. I'm trying to eat something semi healthy, but yeah, it's uh, it's like mediocre at best. So these guys create a new category and they call up the sushi rito. They take the concept of a burrito and they apply it to sushi. And therefore, they solve an, the problem called, how do I eat sushi on the go? And they're killing it. And like I said, there's six or seven of them. They're growing very rapidly. And they are not competing on the traditional dimensions. They're competing on a new dimension, which is, what's the best way to eat sushi on the go? Ta-da, a sushi rito. And so they have differentiated themselves, and I use that word very much on purpose, by creating a new category of sushi called the Sushi Rito. And there are now knockoffs of the Sushi Rito who are trying to engage in a battle with them saying, well, our Sushi Rito tastes better than their Sushi Rito. But just like the idiots at Pepsi, when you do that, when you rip off the Sushi Rito, 
all you're doing is telling the world that the original sushi Rito is better than my knockoff poser sushi Rito, right? And and yet this is the mistake that entrepreneurs make over and over and over again. They are essentially doing a copycat strategy. And my question is, why fit in when you can stand out? Why not do something unique? If you look at every company, every entrepreneur, every marketer, every brand, every artist, every scientist, uh, every political leader that you respect, admire, uh, love, enjoy, they all share some characteristics. And one of them is they broke or took new ground. They are viewed as being the first. Whether they were or they weren't is irrelevant. But the reason we know who Picasso is, and if you look at his Wikipedia page in the first or second sentence, it says he's the founder, he's the godfather, he's the creator of a new type of art called cubism. Well, we know his name. We don't know the 87th most successful cubist artist in the world. We never heard of her, right? We know who Bob Marley is. We don't know who the 32nd most popular reggae band in the world is because Bob Marley is the category designer of a new category, a new type of music called reggae. And so my question for entrepreneurs, my question for marketers is who would you rather be? Picasso or Marley or the 47th company? Would you rather be Sushi Rito or the fifth Sushi Rito company? Imagine it, a spreadsheet filled with rows and rows of your sales enablement assets. You've devoted two years to organizing this masterpiece only for it to stop making sense. This was Chad Trabuco's reality. As the head of sales enablement at Glint, a LinkedIn company, he's responsible for instilling confidence in his sales reps and arming them with the information they need to do their jobs. However, when his glorious spreadsheet became too complex, he realized he needed a new system. That's when Chad turned to Guru. With Guru, the knowledge you need to do your job finds you. Between Guru's web interface, Slack integration, mobile app, and browser extension, teams can easily search for verified knowledge without leaving their workflow. No more siloed or staled information. Guru acts as your single source of truth. For Chad, this meant Glint sales reps were left feeling more confident doing their jobs. See why leading companies like Glint, Shopify, Spotify, Slack, and more are using Guru for their knowledge management needs. Visit b2bgrowth.getguru.com to start your 30-day free trial and discover how knowledge management can empower your revenue teams. Right, right. So I've heard a couple of comments on kind of whether a category exists in kind of its nascent stages. And so what I mean by that is for some folks say, well, it's not really a category if you're the only company participating in that space. In order for it to be a category, there has to be uh, multiple companies participating. Now, at the same time, there, there still has to be a first because at one point that category did not exist and then one company emerged, two, three, four, five, and so on. And so how do you balance that dynamic of looking at a space, wanting to be the first, but also recognizing that if others don't participate in that space, then maybe you haven't really designed a category. Maybe you've just designed a unique position. And is that a downside? Is that something negative you should look out for? Or maybe I'm looking at things the wrong way. Yeah, it's a great question. So I I actually just had this conversation with an entrepreneur and he was going to name his product and his category the same thing, and he was going to trademark them. And I said, well, if you trademark it, it won't become a category, right? So iPhone is a brand, smartphone is a category, right? Right, right. And so that's ultimately what you want. You want to have a category name that you do not trademark, and you absolutely want competition to rip off. And here's the truth. Look, let me just say something. It may not make me a lot of friends, but I'll say it anyway. Most people are freaking stupid. Most people are not creative. Most people are not innovative. Most people don't do any real thinking. That is to say, thinking about thinking is the most powerful thinking you can do. And most people don't do thinking about thinking. Uh, my friend and mentor, Bix Bixen, said, most people and most companies are living inside of somebody else's thinking. And ultimately, category design is a way of thinking about new ways of 
having a market category work in your favor, right? And so given all of that, if you design a new category, you evangelize that category powerfully with a really creative, innovative point of view that frames a problem and teaches the world to move from the way it is to the way you want it to be. Don't drive to Blockbuster, go to a website called Netflix and just have the movies magically show up in your mailbox. And of course, today we stream them. That's an idea. That's a point of view, right? And so here's the truth. If you have a powerful category design that, that, and a point of view that delivers against that category design, then your idiot competitors, when they see you having success, will rip you off. They will come and you want to welcome them. Mm. So you, you don't want to look at competition as a negative. It's something you really want to foster to help go back to that a point you made earlier about as a category leader, you don't want to market your product. You want to market the category itself and having competition really helps you do that. Yes. And so the only way I want to compete is by having others compete with me. I don't want to compete with anybody else. So when somebody says, well, who's your competition? My answer is always, well, we, we don't have any real direct competition. We do something different. And that changes the conversation. If I say to you, hey, John, let's go out to dinner tonight. And maybe you're visiting me here in Santa Cruz. And I'm telling you about some of my favorite restaurants in town. And I say, and so I'm thinking about maybe Italian or sushi. Which do you prefer? That forces a choice in a way that, you know, I'm thinking about Italian or pizza doesn't force a choice. You follow mm -hmm. me? And so legendary entrepreneurs, the way they want to compete is by having others compete with them, but we don't compete with others. Sarah Blakely, the founder of Spanx and the creator of the shapewear category, refused to have her, and these are her words, innovation, her invention, um, be thought of as a girdle. It's not a girdle. It's shapewear. It's a new invention. Those are her words, right? And the reality is, it would have been very easy to position that stuff as a girdle 2.0. And nobody wants a girdle. But hey, shapewear, wouldn't you like to be a little bit more shapely? And she's the, the most wealthy, self-made female billionaire in American history. And it's because she distinguished herself, because she did something different. And now there are shapewear competitors. Same thing with Lululemon. I don't know about where you live, John. But sometimes I think in Santa Cruz County, there's a law that says 25% of the women must be wearing Lululemon pants at all times. <laughs> yep. And they are the creators of a new category of clothing called athleisure, right? Yep. And now when women go to buy, quote unquote, yoga pants or athleisure clothes, they are the gold standard because they are by definition the category queen. And so if you're not wearing Lulu, then you're not wearing the original stuff. They created a whole new paradigm in women's clothing. Now, had there been stretchy, uh, spandexy, you know, clothes fitting pants for women before? Sure, there had, of course. But they went out and evangelized this athleisure lifestyle and tied their category to an emerging, I don't know if you want to call it sport or activity or whatever you want to call it, called yoga. And by doing those things, bam they created a whole new category of clothing where one did not exist. And most people today, just like when, when if I'm sneezy, I might say to you, hey, John, please pass me a Kleenex, which of course is a brand name and the category is called a tissue, right? Most people say, well, oh, you know, uh, she's wearing Lululemon pants. She may or may not be wearing that brand. Lululemon has become the, the Kleenex of uh, athleisure and yoga pants. So Tesla a few years ago released the patents on its battery design. And I remember reading the commentary at the time and it was, I think, supporting the same idea of, you know, Tesla didn't just want it to be the only maker of, of electric cars. They really wanted the electric car category to grow and blossom. And it knew by releasing those patents, it would um, help foster that. So is that kind of what you're talking about in terms of fostering competition and not maybe trademarking or keeping everything in-house, but allowing that ecosystem to, to thrive? Yes, absolutely. And I would say that Elon Musk is one of the most exciting, natural, intuitive category designers in our world today. And 
he understood this, that if I'm the only company evangelizing uh, the electric car, then this category might not go. I need to get the entire industry to tip. I need to move the industry from the way it is, fossil fuels, to the way I want it to be, electricity. And I need the help of competition to move a giant category in this newly designed direction that I just created. That's exactly what he was doing. And it's pure genius. And it's worked. Look at the number of new electric cars. Now, you could argue, well, was that going to happen anyway? I don't know. But here's what we do know. He evangelized the, the car. He prosecuted the magic triangle. That is to say, got product, company, and category right. And to your point, he's purposely expanding the category by sharing some of the secrets with his competitors so that they can collaborate with him on making the category tip. Hmm. So Chris, if I'm listening to this podcast and I'm an entrepreneur, an exec marketer, thinking about category design, how do I know if it's something my company should pursue? It's not something that necessarily every company can or should pursue, right? We don't need 10,000 categories of products, but you know, how does someone make that distinction of whether they go down this road or choose a different path? Well, and look, you can argue I'm overly biased. I think if you're not doing category design, you're an effing moron. Because what you're declaring by saying we're not going to do that is by definition, we're going to let somebody else decide what the problem is, what the solution is, and teach people about how to value that problem and solution. And as a result of that, we are going to submit to having the company that designs this category that we're in design it and take two-thirds of the economics. And we will be one of the 15, 25, 45, whatever competitors fighting for a quarter of the economics. So if you want to just play for a quarter of the economics while somebody else sets the rules in your industry, in your market, in your category, I think if you consciously make a frontal lobe decision to do that, you're an effing moron. That's what I think. All right. Love it. Love the, um, I love the candor. So I want to ask you one last question. It's not about category design, or maybe it is, but uh, you know, I'm here in Lexington and most of the world's bourbon is made within a couple of hours of where I live. And I know that you uh, enjoy kind of seeing what's, what's best in that space. So uh, top three bourbons, uh, three, two, one, go. You know, I'm going to have a real lousy answer. I, I kind of like them all. I mean, I, you know, I drink a lot of scotch. I, I love bourbon. I think probably my go-to daily bourbon is just a good old-fashioned bullet bourbon. Uh, I get in trouble with a lot of scotch uh, guru guys because I like Jack Daniels. I like a Jack and Coke. I like Gentleman's Jack. I like, I don't know if you've had the Frank Sinatra Jack. That's a really fun one. And so I'm generally somebody who mixes it up. I, when I go into a bar, you know, if they have a good bourbon selection, I, I'll ask the, uh, oh, here's here, this, this great category design. Remember when they used to be bartenders? Yeah. You know what they're called today? What are they called Mixologists. Today? Mixologists, right. That's what they are. They're mixologists. When I was a kid, if you bought a secondhand car, you were buying a used car. Today, we don't buy used cars. We buy pre-owned cars. <laughs> That's all category design. That, those are people changing thinking about a particular uh, market category. Anyways, I digress. Like, like I said, like Kevin said, category design is a new lens on business. And once you have the lens, you see categories everywhere. So to get back to your question, John, I, I will often go in and I will say to the mixologist, you know, you guys look like you have an awesome, awesome selection of whiskeys and bourbons. What do you have that's new? What do you have that's exciting? What do you have that's interesting? What should I try? And I generally don't have mixed drinks. A mixed drink for me is a Jack and Coke. I, if I'm going to drink a bourbon, I like it neat. I like my bourbon with bourbon, just like I like my coffee. I like coffee with coffee. And I think putting other, I almost said a different word that begins with S, but I'll say stuff in my <laughs> bourbon or in my coffee is somewhat blasphemous. And look, I know having spent time in Scotland and, and so forth, there are some experts that say you should really put a little water in there, a little ice in there to quote unquote, open it up. I think all that's BS. I like bourbon in my bourbon. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah, well, it's kind of an interesting space to watch because it is very, very crowded. If you go to 
you know, a, a liquor store around here, you'll see literally hundreds of bourbons on the shelf. And so every once in a while, you'll see someone who's trying to kind of reframe that conversation or talk about a different bourbon or a different blend while still kind of remaining to, true to that kind of the heritage of bourbon. So it's really interesting to kind of see what ideas stick and which are just kind of flashes in the pan. And I love the innovation, the new category of whiskey that I love. It's at least new to me. Maybe it's been going on for a while and I didn't notice it. I'm, I'm not, I don't follow it super closely, but there is a, um, a whiskey that's made here uh, in the Santa Cruz area called Wayward Whiskey. And uh, I joined their club and I, you know, get a selection of stuff from them every quarter. And you got to go to their place and pick it up, which is fun. It's just the other side of town for me. And I was in there uh, a couple of weeks ago, John, and uh, picking up my quarterly drop ship of, of yummy. And uh, while I was in there, I noticed behind the bar, because they have a tasting area, they had this very sort of uh, dark, ruby, almost blood ready looking whiskey. And I'm sort of trying to read the label. Anyway, long story longer, it's whiskey that has been aged in port barrels. Oh, really? And I love port and I love whiskey. And I'll tell you, man, is this ever good. I, I'm, I'm going to buy a case of it. It is absolutely outstanding. And so right now, my favorite go-to is wayward whiskey aged in port barrels. Nice. So does that count as a new category of whiskey or is that just a differentiation? It's play? new to me. I don't know if it was, if it's, if it's been a longstanding category, I had never heard of it. So I'm guessing it's new, but I, I can't tell you for sure, but it certainly was new to me. I hadn't heard of anyone else uh, doing it. And if you start paying attention, you know, you'll start to see new categories all over the place. I just saw one. Let me see if I can grab it for you quickly. A new category of jerky. I was in my favorite local local store, local market. Yeah, here it is. Ahi tuna jerky strips. Mm. Wild cut, cut, whole cut, island teriyaki tuna jerk strips from a company called Wildly Responsible. So it's ahi tuna uh, jerky strips. So there you I'm go. Getting, I'm getting kind of hungry and thirsty just talking to you on this interview. We're talking <laughs> about jerky and bourbon. Coke, Pepsi earlier. Oh, lots of good stuff. Chris, thanks so much for all the advice you shared today. I could probably pick your brain for another few hours, but uh, just what you've shared so far has been tremendously valuable. If someone wants to get in touch with you and ask a few questions about category design, learn more about your work, uh, what's the best way for them to do that? Lockhead.com. L-O-C-H-H-E-A-D.com. Lockhead.com. Got it. All right, Chris. Thanks again. It was an honor to talk to you. I really appreciate you being on the show. John, I'm stoked to be with you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. We totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast, and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. Three.